Okay. Hello, everybody, and thanks for, for coming along. Um, I've called this talk, I'll do the introduction sort of as I go through, but I've called this talk uh, A Social History of Ranscombe's Wild Plants. I use the term social history a little bit loosely, but really it's come about because, as many, perhaps most of you know, I spent nearly 10 years working as project manager for plant life at Ranscombe Farm Reserve. Um, and this meant I spent a lot of time thinking about the site's plants, um, where they came from, why they are at Ranscombe, how they've survived. And I realised in doing that, there were some interesting stories that the plants were telling and that the site was telling. And I thought perhaps they deserve to be a bit more widely known. So hence, here we are. Um, Apologies if any of this is familiar to anybody. Some of you may be very familiar with some of the things I say, but a lot of it was new to me. Uh, and I hope there'll be a lot of new and interesting stuff uh, for you as well. I certainly found it very interesting. Um, first off, we need to brush up our Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare uh, refer, refers to plants quite a lot in his writing. There are websites you can go to that will give you a list of Shakespeare's plants, um, all sorts of uh, little interesting snippets are there. But in one play, he refers to one of Ranscombe's most important plants, which is this one, corncockle, purple flowers. Um, and corncockle was once common and very widespread in arable farmland. Uh, is now vanishingly rare. And I think it illustrates how the loss of wild plants means that we lose connections with the past. We lose our understanding or common references that our predecessors would have understood. Um, it's a plant that survives very poorly as seed in the soil. It's an annual, uh, associated with cornfields mainly or cereal fields, survives very poorly as seed in the soils. And historically, it really relied on the inefficiency of pre-industrial seed cleaning. Um, the seeds are large, they're heavy, and they're very difficult uh, to separate from grain, harvested grain, uh, with sort of pre-industrial methods. And so the saved grain that was sown the following year in the field uh, would contain potentially corn cockle seeds and uh, the corn cockle would get sown against, sown again with um, the grain. Now in Coriolanus, uh, Shakespeare actually mentions this, or he uses this as an analogy. Um, there's a lovely old fashioned look at Coriolanus. I could have picked all sorts of things, including Ray Fiennes in a recent film version. It's not perhaps one of the best known plays, um, but Coriolanus in the play is a Roman nobleman uh, in a time where there's a lot of public unrest and there's food shortages. Um, and he himself, he, he despises the common people of Rome, really, and he can't bring himself to flatter them or please them. And at a time when the rest of the Senate are uh, wanting to dispute grain to appease the hungry uh, Romans, he says, no, you shouldn't have any access to supplies of corn. Uh, and he thinks that if this is done if corn is handed out for free it just causes further unrest and he uses this uh, analogy with corn cockle he says i it's here i say again in soothing them we nourish against our senate the cockle of rebellion insolent sedition which we ourselves have plowed for sowed and scattered so he believes that or he's using the analogy you hand out the uh, grain uh, and in the same way you would if you sowed grain, you'd probably get corn cockle in mixed amongst it, and that would be a problem for your next crop. Amongst the people, you would get rebellion arising the same way as an unwanted weed in the field, effectively. So that an analogy, that reference is not further explained in the text. It's, it's Shakespeare clearly understood uh, how corn cockle worked as a plant. He was familiar with it, and he thought his audience would be familiar with it too. Um, and I think that's interesting because how many people now would actually understand that reference enough 
to just get it as it passed by in a speech. Um, it's clear that that demonstrates to us the way in which um, the plants have vanished. These common, once common cornfield flowers have disappeared so very quickly. I will come back to cornfield flowers later on. Um, nowadays, Ranscombe is thought, thought of as uh, one of the best, if not the best place to see rare plants of arable farmland, these annual cornfield weeds. Um, but really the importance of these plants at Ranscombe or the community of plants at Ranscombe only became apparent during the 20th century. And the plant that actually put that area, that site on the botanical map was this one. This is Meadow Clary. Um, and to, if we're going to talk about that and to understand that pl uh, plant's place in the history of Ranscombe, we need to go back really to the start of modern field botany. Um, and then you're getting back to the sort of 1600s, so not long after Shakespeare. And about that time, plant hunting going out botanizing was starting to get big. Uh, in 1597, John Gerard published his Herbal, which describes wild and cultivated plants and their medicinal uses. Um, and this was revised and updated and corrected in 1633 by Thomas Johnson, who was an apothecary uh, uh, based in London, so effectively an early pharmacist. And he added notes on where he personally had found plants during his own excursions. He went out and looked at plants in the wild. And it's some of you may have read the recent article uh, by uh, Richard Maybe in British Wildlife, where he describes uh, one of the plant hunting trips that uh, Johnson organised uh, for the Society of Apothecaries, which was one of the London livery companies. Um, and he took some people out and went around North Kent, which was a, at this time, was a really important uh, or handy area for early botanists to go and explore because that time road travel was difficult, slow, uh, and you pretty much did better if you went on foot or if you went very far, you'd want to go by boat. Um, so coming out from London was handy to see bits of North Kent. And in 1629, Johnson and uh, his associates made two trips to Kent, uh, which are described in a book called uh, the Ita Plantarum. Everyone dealing in Latin, if they were learned, they felt that they had to write in Latin. Otherwise, it wasn't serious enough stuff. But he describes these trips, uh, one of which started by taking a boat from Graves to Gravesend from London. Uh, and then they went pretty well, uh, mainly on foot to Rochester, Gillingham, up to Queenborough, cross on a boat to the uh, to um, Grain and came back in a big loop over several days. And, and it's uh, interesting, you can find uh, the uh, translation of the Ita Plantarum online, actually read it. It's quite interesting to see what the plants they found and uh, the way they were uh, received as well. Uh, where they turned up poking around for plants. Um, and these kind of excursions and this writing that uh, Johnson made um, have led to him actually being labelled as the father of British botany. Now, these 1629 trips didn't seem to make it to Ranscombe from the description, but um, because uh, land that's now Ransom Farm Reserve is very close to Watling Street, close to the city of Rochester, where you could find an inn to put you up, um, meant that it fell within easy reach of some of these early explorers. And in um, the 1633 edition of Gerard's Herbal, Thomas Johnson actually notes that he found Yellow Archangel, uh, quote, growing in the woods belonging to the Lord Cobham in Kent. So he was in the area. He certainly came to uh, very close to what is now Ranscombe Farm, might have actually been in it. Um, can't be absolutely certain from that. Uh, the Cobham uh, Woods area is very large. So we have to wait until we get to 1696 to get the first definite evidence of visiting botanists uh, to Ranscombe Farm, which was when the finding of Meadow Clary, this plant, 
was reported by a guy called Leonard Plucknett um, in his book, which was called the Almagestum Botanicum Seaway Phytographiae Plunkenettiani Onomasticon. I love the title um, in, this, in this sort of uh, modernized scientific Latin they used. Um, translates as great botanical treatise or Plucknitz alphabetical list of plant descriptions if you stick it through an online Latin translator as I did. Um, Pluck, Plucknitz was interesting. He was, uh, oh, I'll come back to that one. He was one of the most prominent botanists uh, of his day. He was um, put in charge of the Royal Gardens at Hampton Court in the reign of William and Mary and his uh, pressed plant specimen collection and his pressed insect collection because that's what they used to do um, pressed butterflies and goodness knows what they they were amongst the founding collections of the Natural History Museum so he was he was a, a very high up guy and this is the entry amazingly you can find if you hunt enough online a copy of the, of the whole of the book um, and this is the entry which I cribbed out of it for the plant. It took a bit of hunting. Fortunately, a very uh, was very useful, very lucky to be able to use the work that um, Geoffrey Kitchener has done on the uh, Kent Rare Plant uh, Register, of, uh, the plant accounts that are available on the uh, BSBI Kent page, because he's he's gone back through some of these and pointed the right direction to this book. It took a little bit of hunting to find the entry because he doesn't call it salvia pretensis as we do now because this is before Linnaeus's uh, binomial system. So it's Hormenum pretensi folius serratis, um, which made it a little harder to find it in an alphabetical list because it's the other end of the book. And that text pretty much is the, the description he has and the words he has about it and it's clear from this that he recognizes it's not the same plant as wild clary and then he says at the bottom this stuff which again i had to stick through a translator a few times um but it effectively what he's saying is it was recently discovered at least once if the people saying so are to be believed in the kentish park of cobham your cantiani vivario cobhamensi uh, in the bottom there. So that is the first uh, record of Meadow Clary from uh, the site. And this clearly put the place a little bit on the map for these early botanists and people started coming out to Cobham, to Cobham Woods, um, to what is now Ranscombe, because we know this Meadow Clary site that's named in there is, is the same place where it grows today. They started coming out and poking around because they wanted to to find uh, Meadow Clary. Um, so about 100 years later, another plant was discovered um, at Ranscombe and like Meadow Clary as the first British record in the wild. Uh, and that's uh, rough mallow or hairy mallow, which is this plant. Um, and we know this is the first record. It was uh, in another book in Latin, Synopsis Plantarum Insulis Britannicis Indigenarum by uh, the Reverend Gellinger Simons. And he points out that a guy called Rhea found it in a ploughed field near Cobham in 1792. So those are the two plants that, that really um, registered Ranscombe as a place for botanists because they were brand new records for, for Britain in the wild uh, for the botanical community. So after that, Ranscombe became a very definite destination for botanists. Um, and you can see some of that. Again, Geoffrey Kitchener writes about it in uh, the accounts for these two plants in the, uh, on the rare plant uh, register accounts. Um, but there's another really useful website that lets you look at plant findings. It's this one, which is Herbaria at Home, uh, which has thousands and thousands of scans of herbarium specimens um, all 
searchable as well so you can search by the species name or location or vice county or the recorder or whose collection it was in because there are a lot of um, corresponding groups and individuals that corresponded and sent each other specimens so for instance um, Drews, the famous botanist Drew said plants from Raskob in his collection but as far as I can see they were collected for him by other people um, but it's uh, fantastic you can see how many people came afterwards and how many of them went away with a specimen of a rough mallow or a specimen of uh, a meadow clary uh, and lodged those in a in a herbarium in their own herbarium or left them or passed them on to other herbaria this guy who collects this specimen was probably the most prominent actually of, of some of these early visitors um, this is the um, Reverend Professor John Stevens Henslow as it says there at the top um, and this is uh, from the bottom of the sheet that's that is his specimen uh, a bit of a view of the sheet of his specimen of rough mallow that he collected in 1827 this is his annotation on the bottom of the herbarium sheet um, saying he visited in July 1827 J.S. Henslow and the Reverend W. S. Hoare, it looks like, or maybe Hove. Um, some of you will no doubt recognise the name of Henslow. He was uh, at that time Professor of Botany at Cambridge. Um, the year after, 1828, um, he met Darwin became Darwin's tutor at Cambridge and shortly after that um, Henslow himself uh, who you see was a local lad he knew Rochester he came from Rochester originally uh, Henslow himself was offered uh, the place as uh, the naturalist on the Beagle um, but didn't want to, to take it and uh, suggested Darwin as uh, the replacement for him and uh, we know where that all progressed and led So these guys who tend to be learned academics, but you get through the 19th century, um, natural history studies started to get a bit more democratized because you were getting an emergence of a, a middle class, particularly an urban middle class, um, a larger number of people who had sufficient money and sufficient leisure time to take up hobbies. And a popular hobby uh, in the 19th century was botanizing. Um, 1836 you've got the founding of the Botanical Society of London which is now the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland the BSBI um, three years after its uh, founding the society published its first proceedings and they have a report in it of a botanical excursion to Cobham and Cuxton uh, again uh, I have Geoffrey Kitchen to thank for pointing me in the right direction of this and you can Again, you can find the document online. I think it's probably in the, the BSBI archive somewhere. Um, if you hunt for it and dig through and find this write up. And these were people who uh, wanted to go down to look for Meadow Clary and Rough Mallow. Um, and they went um, pretty much on foot. They started in Woolwich. Uh, they walked out, I'll show you the route they took, they walked out stopping on the way, it took them a couple of days uh, travel to get to Cobham, um, where they poked around and then they returned, whether they actually walked back or caught a boat back, it's not clear, um, but they went about 20 miles on foot over a couple of days botanising all the way, uh, and the first time they failed to find the plants actually, where, or they found to find the spot they were looking for, they did find Meadow Clary apparently at a slightly different place in what is now Mill Hill um, woodland in a new plantation there which where it's clearly not there now um, but they have a little moan in the document about how poor the uh, directions uh, botanists give each other are because it just said near the junction of three parishes Cobham, Cuxton and Strood um, and they weren't terribly happy with the fact they had walked 20 miles and poked around and went back without finding that spot they went back um the same year and they did find the spot and they did find the plants in the end so it wasn't entirely wasted 
um, this was just one of a number of meetings uh, of botanists or excursion by botanists going out this way. This is this is the, roughly the route from the places they describe. Um, they stopped over near Gravesend before getting down to Ranscombe, the right hand star, the, the, the top left yellow star is Woolwich. Um, and that was all on foot that whole journey and picking up plants and writing down the plants that they found and proceeding till it was too dark to go on any further some days. Um, I am mightily impressed by the ability of Victorian naturalists to walk around the place. They would cover huge distances. Um, uh, just amazing energy. I guess this was a time when walking huge distances was part of daily life. Uh, if you wanted to get to work, you had to walk. And so people were perhaps much fitter or more able to, or well, how they managed it in thick Victorian woolen clothing and uh, Victorian boots and shoes. I'm not entirely sure. It must have been a, a quite a tough experience. There's an interesting, as an aside, an interesting story in a, another book from a, a 19th century entomologist in East London who was keen on moths and he uh, decided he heard that uh, uh, somewhere up near Wickham Fen was very good for moths and, so, and he knew it was somewhere sort of north and east a bit and he just headed out and kept asking directions uh, not realizing it was going to take him miles I think it was about 80 miles and he uh, he actually finally got there well on, on foot and uh, uh, with uh, help of carters and carriers uh, had a nice time moth collecting and then turned around uh, and walked back home to London which I, is absolutely astonishing I the, when I think of the the how far I go before I start complaining I'm, I'm just mightily impressed so that's those guys another very famous botanist who was at uh, Ranscombe looking at these plants was uh, J. Lousley, Ted Lousley, who wrote the uh, 1950 New Naturalist uh, book on wildflowers of chalk and limestone. He was another uh, sort of um, middle class uh, botanist. His, he, his career was, as, uh, was in finance. He was a banker. He worked at the London Stock Exchange. Um, but in his spare time was, was an exceptional botanist and, and apparently on his death in 1976, he left a collection of just short 25,000 pressed and labeled plant specimens. You can see on the top right of this uh, one on his sheet of rough mallow, SLBI South London Botanical Institute is where um, that specimen, I think both of those now reside. And he writes of a in in the book in the new naturalist book on wildflowers talk of uh, chalk and limestone he writes of a place on the west side of the river medway where rough mallow uh, has led a somewhat checkered existence for at least a century and a half and notes uh, that alongside it there's ground pine broadleaf cupweed and uh, his quote our oldest locality from meadow clary being nearby. So clearly the place he's talking about, though he doesn't name it, is uh, Kitchenfield, um, which is the top end, the western end of Ranscombe Farm Reserve. Um, and we can find the plants that he actually collected. And when he went, these specimens are, uh, from the Herbarium at Home website show that actually when he visited it was 1933. Um, and he uh, collects both these and some other plants. Um, and he notes in his, his annotation in the rough mallow that it's a, abundant in cultivated ground on the edge of great wood. While he was there, he was uh, collecting other things. He collected this one, which is uh, narrow fruited corn salad, another one of the uh, very rare, now very rare, uh, cornfield or arable plants. Um, and there were other 20th century visitors who started to spot some of these plants, which perhaps were uh, catching their interest um, because this was about the time they were starting to decline in abundance and distribution as farming practices improved and changed. Um, the cornfield weeds were starting to decline and perhaps that's why they started to 
uh, become more collected. You don't find so many older specimens of these things in the uh, nine, in the herbarium at home, herbarium at home website. Um, there's uh, yeah, this is again um, Lousley's annotation from the bottom again in 1933 visit, finding it in a chalky field south of Cobham Park. So again probably um, kitchen field or one of the other arable fields on the south side of the wood in, in what's now Ranscombe. Um, this was a search I did to looking at uh, another prodigious botanist, the Reverend Douglas Montague Heath, who lived over in Essex but uh, travelled widely uh, about the place collecting and you can see that he got Rough mallow, he's taking ground pine, Ajuki camipitis, Althea hasuta is rough mallow. He's got broadleaf cudweed, Philago pyramidata, as well as the meadow clary, um, Salvia pretensis, on a visit he made in 1926. And indeed, this is again his specimen on, on there with the date. Uh, chalky field is all it says, but it'll be somewhere in that similar location. Now, I think it's probably worth thinking about the kind of place these people were coming to, because, of course, now we think of it as a nature reserve. The, the white line uh, on that is the outline of Ranscombe Farm Reserve. The big urban area uh, to the top right is Strood, the built up part of Strood, and alongside runs the M2 motorway. And then alongside the motorway, you can see the Channel Tunnel rail link. And then to the south of uh, uh, the bottom of the picture, to the south of the reserve is the village of Cuxton. And outside the white line uh, to the northwest, to the top left is National Trust Cobham Park. And you just see a little white dot, which is the Cobham Mausoleum. So that white outline is current Ranskin, but of course this isn't where they were going. They were going to farmland, privately owned land. Um, and when you look in the early 19th century, this is actually uh, all of this and lots more beside was um, owned by the Earl of Darnley, who resided at Cobham Hall um, and pretty much owned all the land uh, between Rochester and Gravesend, probably, uh, certainly to, to the west, uh, north and south and east of uh, Ranscombe there. Um, but it was let out to, to tenants. So the woodlands, most of the woodlands was retained by the Earl himself, presumably getting the income from the timber use. Um, this area outlined in red, though, this was Ranscombe Farm. That was Ranscombe Farm proper, the buildings at Ranscombe Farm that were the original farm buildings are there. This was leased to a tenant. Um, and what is the southern part of the reserve there outlined in yellow was part of Court Lodge Farm. So there are actually two different farms. The white arrow indicates Court Lodge Farm actually went beyond the current bounds of the reserve, uh, whereas Ranscombe pretty much was, is all within uh, that red line. Um, so two different farms, although at the time of the Tide census in the 1840s, they were under the same tenant. Uh, they're both uh, tenanted by William Pye. Then land in the bottom right was Longhose Field belonged to a bigger farm that was uh, more extensively to the south east of what is now Ranscombe and at least parts of uh, Brockles Field in the uh, southwest corner of Ranscombe belonged to, um, I think it was Brick or Lower Brick Farm a different farm there as well. So there were four different land holdings, but all all um, owned by uh, the Earl of Darley ultimately. And this was the kind of the farmed landscape that these people moving in, coming in and looking plants around would have been different. It was still largely arable outside the woodland. But remember, you would be coming up against uh, private owners and possibly gamekeepers and foresters and farmers who might wonder what on earth you were doing there at the time. Um, Cobham Hall itself has, has uh, a fascinating history. Um, so the estate, well, it goes back a long way. Uh, around the time that we're talking about there, 
where botany is is becoming a, a natural history becoming a pursuit a public more of a public pursuit uh, it was um well originally right at the start belonged to the len the lennox is later duke of richmond who did some development um the duke of richmond died without uh heirs and the estate as it says in 1672 the estate passed to um his sister Catherine o'brien she found herself with a huge estate and a mass of debts uh and married uh, not long after sir joseph williamson who was wealthy uh a politician and statesman and diplomat um which actually seems to have saved the estate eventually it passed it was from there it was sold to uh the blythe family john Bly becoming the first earl of darnley and it remained in that family until the 20th century uh when a parts were sold off the hall is now um a private school um if there are cricket fans out there you'll no doubt be aware that ivo Bly, who was the late uh, who was uh, the eighth Earl of Darnley was um, the cricketer who captained the first England uh, victory in the uh, the very first Ashes Test, um, and the uh, Ashes urn uh, resided uh, at actually at Cobham Hall until I think uh, Ivo Bly's death when it went to the MCC uh, and is uh, displayed there. Sir Joseph Williamson, who pulled the estate together and actually um, seems to have held it together from the stuff I've read it under his, even though it had debts when he married into the estate, um, he, by the time of his death, it was still running from Gravesend at one side to Rochester at the other. So it's a massive, massive estate that would have included all of Ranscombe and plenty beyond. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, person he was obviously rich enough to save the estate and he left the money to found the Rochester Math School which is actually where I went way 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 back um, his money wasn't all cleanly gotten though uh, he was um, close to the Duke of York who became James II and um, Sir Joseph Williamson was an investor in and administrator of the Royal African Company which was set up uh, by the Duke of York to get a monopoly on West African trade, but actually became the um, biggest uh, transporter of uh, enslaved African people to the Americas. Um, many thousands of people. The, the, the historian uh, William Pettigrew apparently said they shipped more enslaved African women, men, and children to the Americas than any other single institution during the entire period of the transatlantic slave trade so his his money wasn't um yeah not well got i noticed the school on their website actually clear clearly acknowledge this now um that's an interesting sideline into the life of someone who gets a commemoration in the uh, cathedral of Rochester every year for his founding of the school anyway back to the timeline um i've mentioned on this one the cement industry, the cement industry is also interesting. So cement started in the Medway Gap. So along the river, sort of south of Rochester, down to Snodland and uh, Larkfield, it started in around the 1850s and built up and it became pretty huge. So that in the 1910s, there were nine separate factories operating upstream of Rochester. Um, and when the... Uh, Blyes came to sell off parts of their estate in the early 20th century. A lot of it ended up with cement companies. In fact, uh, both sides of the Medway for extensive areas are owned uh, by the successors of the now defunct cement companies. Um, and in fact, all of Ranscombe, uh, were, when it was bought as a reserve, was bought from a company which had taken on the land uh, that was um, left when the cement industry in the area closed. Presumably, if cement had 
had stayed as big during the second half of the 20th century as it was in the first. We might have seen much more extensive uh, quarrying around the area. And Ranscombe itself might look very different, as indeed the downs on either side uh, in that area. So interesting how sort of the land has been shaped by economic changes over the 20th century. If we come forward a bit, we can get a bit of a see the bit of the uh, political landscape that these botanists went into. Actually, um, you got down at the bottom the when the uh, kitchen field and the arable plants uh, were added to the triple SI, and when the reserve was uh, established, two thousand and five. And these are the places where the, the sort of botanical timeline. So. Uh, in the end of the 1600s, you got the first discovery of Meadow Clary being published. That's during the time that uh, Joseph Williamson and Catherine were uh, the owners and the managers of the estate. You got Rough Mallow first found under uh, the Blyes uh, around the time that the big changes were being made to Cobham Park by Humphrey Repton to establish the big park that's there today and managed by the National Trust. Henslow coming around that time and then you start to see these botanical excursions happening in the 1840s, 1850s, as the uh, Victorian middle class botanists start spreading out and Lousley's around that point, as indeed was um, uh, Montague Smith um, finding plants. So it's, it's, a, it's a long, long history uh, of botanical exploration. But there's, um, let's say now we've got a reserve which is recognised very much, uh, not just for Meadow Clary and Rough Mallow, but perhaps more uh, for those rare and vanishing plants of, of arable fields. Cornfield weeds, I like the term cornfield weeds. Weedies, uh, it's not pejorative. They are weedy in that they sort of turn up, they're annuals, they're opportunist plants. And these are the, the vanishing species of the wider countryside for which Ranscombe is really important. To understand these plants, uh, we actually have to go a lot further back than the discovery of uh, Meadow Clary. Um, jump in, there we go. We actually have good evidence of very long-term human occupation at Ranscombe, or what is now Ranscombe Farm Reserve, sending back to the Mesolithic when people were still hunter-gatherers largely. Um, um, and certainly uh, it seems likely that, that farming happened at Ranscombe right from the time that farming first happened in Britain uh, as a way of life. Uh, we've got some nice finds from uh, metal detectorists of, for instance, this medieval uh, long cross silver penny, someone's days or more wages that someone dropped and lost in a field. Um, coin minted at uh, Canterbury at around about 1300. So this was not long after the Cobham Manor was actually established when it was given to one William de Cobham and uh, passed out of those hands sort of later on. Um, oh, wrong way. Um, Going back even further, we uh, would know that people were there in the Iron Age. So 90 to 80 BC is around the time that this coin uh, was dropped somewhere in Ranscombe to be found later by a metal detectorist. Um, so we've got this long history, fantastic coins. The top one, this um, Iron Age one, very stylized images on it. You can see on the uh, the face and the, the uh, obverse uh, of it looks quite crude. They were actually turned out to be um, a design which was a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a coin originally minted in Marseille in, when, when it was Greek, uh, the Greek colony at the south of France. Um, and these coins were seen as being of very good quality and good value. And so their design, which had the face of Apollo on one side, were copied and copied until clearly whoever designed the, the copies of the copies of copies didn't know what they were copying. That was meant to look like a face. And it became this sort of stylized design of a big round eye 
in the center and a sort of pointy nose to the left. Um, but it's a testament to the kind of international trade and commerce that was actually going on that people in Britain had seen these coins originally minted in uh, Marseille or seen copies of them uh, and decided to base their own coinage on it uh, that far back. That is a coin of the Cantiani, so it's a local Iron Age coin. So it means there were Iron Age people going about and probably farming, well, certainly I would have said farming at Ranscombe at that time. So farming, history lesson, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with this, but farming as a, as a way of life, um, as the basis for settled human communities, um, it's arisen in lots of places in the world as uh, these green areas on this uh, particular plan I got show the centres of farming development and how they spread out into different parts of the globe. Um, but we're concerned really in our part of the world with uh, the farming that came up through Britain and up uh, through Europe and into Britain. It's uh, developed in the Fertile Crescent. Uh, in the Middle East uh, about 10,000 years ago you got the first settled agricultural societies this is the one uh, interpretation of the extent of the Fertile Crescent it can vary a little bit it went roughly from uh, southern Turkey into in the west um, in uh, to just into uh, Iran in the east goes through uh, Iraq um, and down through so sort of Syria, uh, Palestine, Israel and into just into Egypt. Then that was the area where these societies uh, started farming and where the grasses, the wild grasses were, were bred into the early crops to form the early crops. Um, and those early farm fields, of course, picked up weeds and those weeds stayed with the crops a long time. Um, the, the farming gradually spread out uh, through Europe. It took a long time. It didn't get to Britain. This, this is, again, another map that shows some of the uh, assumed directions of travel of farming. It's an interesting to sort of try and uh, find out some of the history of this. It used to be said they weren't sure whether it was migration of peoples, migration of farming societies uh, through Europe that made farming move or whether it was communication of that culture and uh, so that uh, it was the, the people that were already there took up farming. Um, apparently the more recent um, studies and looking at genetics suggest it was actually a migration of people um, and they obviously moved in quite complex fashions up into northern Europe, west through France, down through Iberia uh, and up into Britain and you can see there's even two two ways into the British Isles that farming probably spread. Um, got to us about 6,000 years ago after a short hiatus around the uh, channel. Um, and those guys were carrying their seed corn with them. They were carrying their grains for sowing. Uh, those grains that had originated as uh, carefully bred crops from wild grasses in the Middle East. And amongst that grain were the weeds seeds that those crops had picked up on the way. Because like uh, corn cockle, if you're, if you're dealing with, um, oh, there we go, there's where it got to. If you're dealing with hand winnowing, as a lot of societies still do, if you're throwing the, your grain in the air and letting the wind carry the seeds out, it's a very imprecise process. Uh, and it means that there's nearly always some weed contaminant amongst the seed you sow the following year. Um, if you manage with that, so much the better, but it wasn't really until the 19th century that we started to be able to mechanize seed cleaning and some of these plants started to decline because it, they weren't getting sown. They were relying more on moving about themselves than they were on being carried by people. But that wasn't the, the story in the, uh, the far past when those people were coming up and carrying those seeds with them. So um, as the people moved and they created new farms, 
fields, new farm societies throughout Europe, the weeds were finding them an ideal uh, new home. This means that the plants that are out cornfield weeds have quite a, a mixed history. Um, some of the things that we see in cornfields today were there from the start. They were plants that uh, found their way to Britain when Britain was still connected to the continent in the Mesolithic before farming societies uh, were present. Um, these are annuals, disturbed ground annuals that must have been able to find a home where, uh, I don't know, natural events like uh, rivers or tree falls or cliff falls created bare ground or perhaps where uh, wild animals, uh, so pigs or horses or cattle or uh, something like that actually caused ground disturbance that made it possible for these plants to germinate uh, and flower. But at least two dozen species of corn, I should have said what they were, of course. On the left, you've got um, long stem crane spill, field madder in the middle and, and ground pine, uh, the wall here first. Um, during the Bronze Age, you've got a lot more species arrive. Um, and this can be uh, this demonstrated through the uh, archaeological record that were at least two dozen species that we now think of as cornfield weeds that arrived with the first farmers and were present by the end of the Bronze Age, which is about 2,800 years ago. So you've got plants like stinking chamomile there on the left. You've got uh, a prickly poppy in the middle there. You've got narrow fruited corn salad uh, on the right, but there were others like opium poppy, uh, rough poppy as well were amongst those plants. And a lot of these still have a distribution right through Europe and, and indeed down uh, through the Middle East as wild plants. Common poppy and corn cockle here, they actually don't start showing up in the archaeology until um, the Iron Age. So that's the end of the Bronze Age, about 850 BC. Um, I think that's what it's in the last one. And uh, to uh, the start of the Roman occupation, which was 43 AD, that's the Iron Age in Britain. Um, so they're late arrivals, um, and there's some speculation this might actually be related not to uh, more crops coming in, but perhaps a trade between the Iron Age Celtic people and the Romans who were present uh, on the near continent. So before the invasion, that there was a trade in grain between the two, and that may have carried contaminants like common popping corn cockle into Britain uh, from Europe. 43 AD, the Romans arrived, stayed for about 400 years. Um, and although I haven't shown any, didn't show any archaeology of Roman, there are Roman coins found in, in Ranscombe, which is hardly surprising because Roman Rochester was just a short walk away. Um, there's a Roman villa at Cobham, but there are plants that appear about that time. Uh, include red dead nettle, hemp bit dead nettle, field forget me not, all start turning up at the Roman period. Um, and this may be to do with the Romans actually bringing more uh, importation of cereal or increased trade with the rest of the Roman Empire. So you've got this sort of slow, over hundreds of years, new plants arriving um, from the continent. Some of them have very interesting origins. Um, it's it's a, interesting just to look at, and not just where came, they came from, but how they came to be a species. And I found this paper, um, although it's it's somewhat old, it's about 30 years old, on, on the geographical origin of poppy species, Papava. Um, and this, uh, I've summarized a little bit of it here. It comes more detail, but for instance, they it suggests that prickly poppy, one of our current rarities, comes came from southern Anatolia in what is now Turkey. Um, soon we picked up in the very early fields um, on the edge of the, the fertile crescent, maybe as farming started to spread. Um, but some are different. Common poppy 
doesn't appear to have had a wild precursor. And it could be that common poppy actually arose around that area, sort of in the dotted pink line, um, as a hybrid of two other species, these two, um, Papaver humili and Papaver carmeli, and that's their range. You can see how they overlap. It may have actually arisen in cultivation uh, as a hybrid that stabilized uh, between these two species. So it could be a plant that actually owes its existence to uh, farming in that area. Um, perhaps a surprise, but then there seem to be other species that, for which this is also true. And, and this is one of them. Um, house sparrows may well have evolved as a new species in response to early farming in, in, the, uh, in the Middle East in the same way that the poppies did. Um, there apparently is the DNA evidence that's, that suggests that at the start of modern farming, an existing sparrow species actually split into two lines. Um, there's a line that avoided people, had a more slender bill for wild grass seeds, and another one which had uh, a thicker bill for eating cultivated grains and which was happy living alongside people. And that's this, the house sparrow. Uh, and this bird appears to have spread through Europe with farming in the same way these plants did. Interesting that the people that did the research on this also found that it had an adaptation to a high starch diet. There's a particular gene which codes for the enzymes that break down starches. Um, and it's very similar to the, the gene that uh, humans evolved at the time they started uh, farming grains and got a much higher starch diet. And apparently a similar gene is also uh, apparent in domestic dogs from around the same time. So there are species that, that have appeared and which we have with us now, which have appeared as a result of the farming. Um, and I, I wonder whether the same might be true of uh, this plant. This is interrupted brome. This is a, a grass which is extinct in the wild and which is considered British endemic. Never been found uh, reliably outside of England, in fact, and which we were working on trying to do reintroduction of work or at least establish a good, reliable population at Ranscombe. And it wasn't known until the early 80, uh, early 19th century it wasn't even recognized as an independent species until 40 or 50 years after its first discovery. And once it was discovered, it was found widespread throughout England, particularly in fields where sanfoin was being grown as a fodder crop, uh, which was very commonly sown as a short uh, duration hay crop. So you'd last a few years and you would um, then plow it and re-sow it or maybe use it in rotation. Um, and sanfoin was everywhere. And then by 1970 or so, it was extinct in the wild. In fact, the last Kent records were from, I think, the 1930s, just up near Hauling. Um, it came, it was widespread, and it vanished really quickly. And there is argument as to whether it was a, an introduction from an unknown foreign source, say, if it was, then no one has ever found that source population anywhere in the world. Or whether it evolved from, say, soft brome or one of the closely related species. Um, I'm not qualified to say, but it does seem to be an argument that perhaps if it did evolve, perhaps it did evolve as a species which found it had a particularly good uh, home in sanfoin crops. Certainly from some of the ways I've seen it operate, it seems to uh that it would do well under the kind of rotations they use the sowing times um the cutting so sanfoin wasn't cropped generally until the second year um that it's the the timing of it may have suited sanfoin and in the 19th century of course uh where the horse was the primary form of transport until the railways overtook and, and eventually motor cars um, hay crops were in massive demand. You had huge amounts of hay had to be produced. Sanfoin would have been very profitable as a crop, and so it would have been very easy for the plant to spread. And then as soon as horse uh, power 
declined, Sanfoin declined and the plant itself declined, eventually disappeared. So I wonder if that's the story of that plant. There's actually a word for these plants. I think they call them anecophytes. This is a group of uh, species um, that have no actual sort of place in really wild systems. They exist alongside people. So just to summarize, um, and this is a summary of all sorts of places I've gone with this sort of uh, so-called social history, but I, I just found amazing and inspiring that you can look at one nature reserve and its plants and it can lead you into so many different stories. You've got links to Shakespeare's place. It tells you things about Shakespeare's world and it tells you things, helps you understand what he's saying. Um, it has things to say about plant evolution and dispersal. When you look at the history of the plants that were there, it has things to say about synanthropic plants, and animals, the plants, and animals that live alongside people and, and whose primary home perhaps is in, um, is in human landscapes. It tells you something about hu European prehistory and human migration and how that relates to plants and how people have traveled and the plants traveled with them and other, other wildlife as well. There are things to say about landscape history, local history, uh, and the way the landscape has changed and the influences upon that landscape over the past 500 years or more. And there are things to say, and which I really like actually about this, is how, how it's so related to the history of natural history as something that people do as, a, as an amateur pursuit, uh, and the ties that the site has to some of the pioneering uh, botanists. Um, just as a complete finish, I, th these are stories and they're still narratives rather than science, but I think the stories matter. Um, people used to tell stories, human societies have often told stories, our society has told stories about itself where wild plants and animals are central to those stories. This is a bit of a manuscript of a medieval uh, set of medieval Welsh tales called the Mabinogion, which were written down, I think, in sort of 1200s, 1300s, but with a much earlier oral source. Um, and what's amazing with those is how much is placed within a landscape which is populated by wild plants and animals. So you get the story of uh, blood day with it was a, a woman conjured by a magician from flowers of oak and meadow sweet and broom uh you get a fantastic story of um killhook and olwen where arthur's knights uh, are going on a quest um are able to enlist the help of animals that which include here the oldest salmon which carried some of them on its back to go and find and free a prisoner there's the oldest oozel and the oldest stag um, and these are sort of critical real characters in the story and i think that reflects really that, that closeness of people in the natural world the closest we used to have to the natural world people lived alongside it in it and amongst it and i think we need uh wildlife to be part of our stories once more thank you very much for that and i'm quite happy to take check questions i can see there's something on the chat haha <laughs> indeed yes i don't know how how a botanist manages to make no I thought about that. It come, uh, it's just, I don't know if other people see it. Trudy Fleming's with that. The, no idea a botanist manages to make, uh, let alone 20 miles progress, any progress at all. And that certainly seems to be the case. I wonder if we are uh, looking now in far more uh, detail, uh, uh, smaller areas in much more detail, because that's what we need to do and what were our places to look for plants are more isolated, whereas these early botanists were exploring a wider landscape and trying to get a feel for a much bigger area, but weren't necessarily catching everything. They did catch a lot though, as we said. <laughs>